Hi, thank you everyone for coming. Um, it's a pretty full house. This is actually my first presentation in, well, in person presentation in over three years. So bear with me. Um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit, I usually present this to other accessibility specialists. So I want to talk a little bit about why I'm going to recommend that you use separate accessibility guidelines to the web content accessibility guidelines. Does anyone here not know what the web content accessibility guidelines means? Well, that's pretty good, excellent. So my work here is done, see you later. <laughs> Um, okay, so WCAG 2, for those, a little history, if you're interested, there is a history of web accessibility on the Accessibility Oz website. I have been operating in web accessibility for <coughs> 24 years, uh, so <laughs> thank you. And I actually spent six years with the W3C um, working on WCAG 2. And they were basically finished in 2004 to 2006. And we wanted to... Um, make the WCAG success criteria applicable to everything, you know, wall screens, any kind of technology that we would see in the future. And, uh, you know, we really hope there would not be a WCAG 3. Guess what? There's going to be a WCAG 3. Because in 2006, the iPhone hadn't been invented. So we were testing, you know, mobile phone websites on these little, you know, um, screens that were like black and white and took forever to load. We had no concept of things like native apps and how we use technology today. So yes, WCAG 2 is applicable to mobile, but there are a whole lot of things that are not included that are really important when it comes to mobile accessibility. And so if anyone asks you, well, why don't you just use WCAG 2? The one example you can give them is keyboard accessibility. So WCAG 2 requires that everything be accessible to the keyboard, but it doesn't require that everything be accessible to the mouse or everything be accessible to the touch screen. So even though we tried to be technology neutral, we did fail. And why is mobile different? So firstly, there are native screen readers that are built into mobile devices that you often don't see in um, uh, PCs and things like that. Uh, things like TalkBack on Android, and VoiceOver on iOS. You have volume control, a, a haptic or vibrational keyboard. You can get visual auditory or vibrational notifications. There's screen rotation. We're used to seeing things in portrait as opposed to landscape. Uh, mono audio, voice control, increased text and display size, reduction of motion, zoom, reader view and simplified view. Now, yes, there, a lot of these things are on desktop as well, but people aren't aware of them and people often have to buy a product or go looking for a product. Whereas in, uh, in a mobile device, it's just kind of taken for granted. And my stepmother, who would never identify herself as having a disability, uses a bunch of what we call these mobile accessibility features just because she's getting old. And so, you know, it's something that people use a lot more than we would see in PC. Uh, so what about, and Mac, of course. Sorry, I know you're developers. <laughs> I am not a developer, can you tell? <laughs> okay, so WCAG 2.1 was released in 2018, a whole 10 years after WCAG 2 was released. And this was supposed to be the you know, the kind of iteration of WCAG 2 while they're working on WCAG 3, which is called WCAG Silver, if you want to sound clever. And so WCAG 2.1 was supposed to address all these issues uh, because the accessibility industry, we're really quite good at kind of making our voices heard. So WCAG 2.1 def definitely builds on this and addresses more criteria related to touch screens such as pointer gestures and sensors and small screen devices. However, it still doesn't cover all the user needs related to mobile accessibility. Now, prior to 2.1 being released in 2018, it was like the wild, wild west when it came to mobile accessibility. Every single accessibility company had their own uh, mobile accessibility guidelines. And one of the things that we found when we collated all these guidelines is every single one required touch screen, uh, touch target size. So when you touch something, it has to have, it has to be a certain size because otherwise you can't touch it. When it came to WCAG 2.1, 
they did have a touch target size requirement, but they'd relegated it to level AAA, which is not required by any government or policy organisation. And as I like to say, AAA is where success criteria go to die. So, you know, it was basically useless. So 2.1 didn't uh, address all the needs. So a group of accessibility specialists got together and developed a mobile testing methodology. Uh, all the major accessibility testing companies in the US and the UK were members of this uh, committee that wrote this methodology. And basically what happened is there's a testing uh, conference that occurs well before COVID, occurred in DC around about this time every year. And in 2017, we had this town hall where we got everyone together at the end of the conference and said, you know, what's the issue that's most uh, affecting us as accessibility specialists? And it was mobile accessibility. So we convened a, com a committee and we basically collated all the mobile accessibility guidelines from all the accessibility companies around the world. And then we thought, because it was 2017, we thought, oh, WCAG 2.1 is going to address all this. So we only have to do it once. And then 2.1 came out and we went, oh, damn it. So we reconvened the committee and we actually went through and we wrote them um, fully and properly. And I was uh, the co-chair. We actually split into two committees. One was the native app um, committee and one was the mobile site committee. And so we basically developed these mobile accessibility testing guidelines, which are now the de facto mobile testing guidelines. Now, if you go, oh my God, why should we listen to you? The thing is accessibility specialists are very vocal and they're very big on just basically doing their own thing if policy organisations like the W3C don't do the right thing. In fact, WCAG 1, which was released in 1999, was developed by a series of accessibility experts that just got together uh, in 1995 and wrote the guidelines. They were the de facto guidelines, 1999 W3C adopted them, and now they're, then they were WCAG 1. We, did, we saw it with uh, XML, we saw it with HTML5, um, over and over again, the policy organisations don't do what we see needs to be done, and so we go off and do it, and then the W3C goes, thank you very much. So, that is um, how it sort of came about. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about methodology, obviously, but I just want to make sure you know that this methodology is everything that you need to do on top of WCAG 2. So you need to, when you're creating native apps or mobile sites, you know, our methodology doesn't say you need to have text alternatives for images because that's in WCAG 2. So you need to do WCAG 2 and this methodology. However, the things that were included in 2.1, we did include in the methodology, but it's very clear um, when we referenced that because there's a whole bunch of times where we as a committee decided that we did not agree with the W3C. Uh, so let's talk about testing methods. Testing methods for mobile sites, there's four main testing methods. Testing on a device, um, testing on a device with an assistive technology, testing on a responsive window, and testing on desktop. When it comes to native apps, there are two main testing methods, which is basically testing on devices and testing on devices with assistive technologies because you really can't get to the code the way that you can with websites. And when I say websites, I mean applications, anything, you know, in a browser. One of the things, if the only thing that you take away from this presentation is you must test with real devices. Simulators do not work, do not work. Did I mention, did not work, do not work. Okay, so this is back in, before COVID and when I used to fly to uh, the States every couple of months, which I'm doing tomorrow, can you tell I'm looking forward to it? And the thing is, is that I, there was no internet on planes back then. Can you imagine 15 hours without internet? I mean, it's really, really hard. So basically we would, <laughs> we would fly, would land at LAX and we sit on the tarmac for an hour or two because there wasn't a gate open. And the, the brilliant thing is when you're on the tarmac of LAX, you can access the LAX Wi-Fi, except when you access it with a mobile phone, which of course is the only thing you can use at that point, you get this little error. Well, it's not an error, it's a it's text. It says, sorry, now I'm getting old. This page will redirect 
so content doesn't really make sense to have here. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I don't want to give you my email address, I don't want to give you my credit card details, and the emails can wait another couple of hours. So this is why you have to test with real devices, because how did this happen? Someone was testing it on a desktop computer somewhere, they never went and tested it on the location and saw what happened. So, and I don't know how I managed to break things, but it's the joy of being a tester, but I always find the things like that. The number of times I've had clients saying, yeah, that's not, that, there's, that's not an error. There's no way that that's our website. It's like, I took a screenshot, it's your website. So, okay, so the methodologies have five steps. The mobile site methodology is uh, they're very similar. The only steps that are different are step two. Now, the, the things that you need to do under the steps are different, but the five steps are basically very similar. Step one, identify devices. Step two, identify site type and variations for the mobile site. Uh, step three, test critical issues. Step four, test mobile specific issues. And step five, test mobile assistive technology and feature support. So when you're testing a native app, the difference is step two, where you need to define the application functionality. So when it comes to identifying devices, we basically came to the conclusion that you really only needed to test on an iPhone, an iPad and an Android phone. When it comes to a website, on the iOS devices, you only need to test on Safari and on Android phone, test on Chrome. Uh, and so if you are, uh, if you're Western world facing, the majority of mobile devices that are used are iOS devices. Uh, if it's more Eastern world facing, then it's Android phones. But in general, people with disabilities prefer iOS devices because they're more accessible. However, in some cases, they go for Android phones because they're cheaper. So it's a little bit complicated. You should look at your statistics basically. Um, other devices you should consider are things like an Android tablet um, and Chrome as well, and things like alternative devices such as a Kindle device. Now, not for your just general website, but if you've got something that you know people are going to use on a Kindle, um, then that's when you need to look at it. In terms of versions, you only really need to test on the latest version of iOS and iPadOS and test on the latest two versions of Android, but really you can get away with the latest version. But be aware that if you have a site directly aimed at people with a particular kind of disability, consider including assistive devices and or assistive te technologies used by potential users. So if you have a website for people with acquired brain injury, for example, then they're going to be using things like Dragon Naturally Speaking, and that's when you need to be testing with that. However, the kind of thing that we have learnt over the last few years, because we released this methodology in January 2020, just in time for COVID, um, the thing that we learnt is that about 70% of the errors that you find on a mobile site um, basically are the same on iOS and Android, and then you have about 30% differentiation. Native apps is a different uh, kettle of fish, depending how they're coded. So when it comes to the mobile site um, or application, uh, it's really important to identify your site type and variations of the page. So you're all developers, you know what I mean by this, but you know you need to decide whether the site is a desktop, an M.dot site or a responsive site. So desktop websites, they have one display whether they're viewed on desktop or mobile. M.dot, they have a particular um, display for mobile and a different display for uh, for PCs or Macs. Now, this actually means that there's two websites. So you need to test both websites as separate websites. And then there's responsive websites, which is basically most of the web. Um, and so it, the screen changes as you, uh, you know, different elements show up depending on the size of the screen. Now, if you're dealing with a client, don't assume that they know what their sites are because I ran mobile uh, this mobile technology training for Stanford and we found an MDOT site that they didn't know that they had and they were the IT team. So, you know, you never know. Um, and the thing to be uh, really, imp uh, really sorry, the thing to really look at is page variations. So basically, you need to, if your page varies, say at a large size, you've got your uh, navigation across the top, and then on a mobile device, it changes to a hamburger, hamburger menu, you need to test your navigation across the top 
and the hamburger menu. They're two separate pieces of code. But the one thing you need to remember is that there will be people who look at your mobile version of your website on desktop because they are increasing text size due to low vision. And there are some cases where if you increase text size enough, you'll find that a whole bunch of different features disappear like an image gallery or your login details or whatever. And that's really problematic. So the other thing to remember is that for all your page variations, all the features of your website need to be available on all those page variations. They can be hidden, uh, they can be on a different page, but they need to be there. Um, and it's, so as I said, essential that functionality is not removed due to a variation in the page. Uh, so basically, what, what do I mean by that? Uh, so this is YouTube that fixed this, but 100% um, text size on PC, you can see the upload and notifications are visible. And then at 200%, when you increase the text size on PC, they disappear. Now, why do they disappear? Because they think you're looking at it on a mobile device. And if you want to upload a video, you'll use the YouTube mobile app. Mobile app. Whereas you might be someone with low vision who's just increased the text size. Uh, and then define application functionality for the native apps. Uh, so basically, you need to really think about the purpose of the native app and define which functionality is critical to use and it must be tested for efficacy, operability and workflow. So what do we mean by this? If you look at the Westpac mobile site, there's a whole lot of information on that website. You know, who do you go for stockbroker tips? How do you apply for a home loan? Um, where do you go for a complaint? You know, where can you apply for a job? The Westpac mobile app is very specific. It's about managing your bank accounts. So native apps are very specific, much more so than mobile sites. So that's what you need to be aware of. So ask the question, how would the experience be impacted if the functionality failed, the content could not be reached, or the experience caused a barrier to the user? And then prioritize. So all functionality should be accessible, but it's important to define and include the critical functionality for each individual app and prioritize that. And then you need to test common elements because there's a lot of common elements in native apps. Things like navigation, landing screens, emergency sections, login flows, settings, accounts and profiles, contact us, real-time updates, privacy policy, terms and conditions, interactional functionality, help section, widgets, calendars, etc., geolocational maps, high traffic areas. I read them aloud in case there's someone with low vision who can't see the screen. Uh, by the way, at the very bottom, there is a link to these slides, uh, which is pz.tt slash mobile dash ds22, but I'll tweet that out or something so you can get that later. Uh, and you need to meet WCAG 2 and this mobile methodology. And then step three is test critical issues. So what we've found with mobile devices is that there are a lot more traps. Uh, new features on mobile devices means there's a lot more traps. So when a user is, what is a trap? When a user is trapped within a component and cannot escape without closing the browser or app. And there are many more traps in mobile devices. And the, the one that most people are aware of uh, keyboard traps, you tab into a component like a video player, and you can't tab out. It's incredibly inaccessible. So we identified five traps, the exit trap, the swipe scroll trap, the text to speech trap, the headset trap and layer trap. So the exit trap is basically where you are, uh, you can't close something and therefore you can't get to the information underneath. So the rule is ensure there is always an accessible actionable item, e.g. a close button that meets color contrast requirements and has an accessible name that closes any feature that overlays the current page, such as a full page ad applies to all users and it's in both methodologies. What do we mean by this? This is a full page ad on Facebook. You think you could tap on the Facebook uh, URL at the top, but you can't. The only way to actually, you can't scroll up and down, it's just stuck on your screen. The only way to actually exit that is to exit the, um, the app and start again. This is another exit trap where you've got a pop-up that's advertising something. Now, the reason why this is an exit trap is because the close button doesn't meet color contrast or touch target size requirements. And the ability to tap outside that area is not enough to make it accessible. 
Then we have the swipe scroll trap. So ensure that you do not override standard mobile touch functions such as swiping or scrolling on the majority of the page. It applies to all touch users and it's both methodologies. This is my favorite example ever. Uh, this is called the zoom of doom. Um, <laughs> basically, if you, you have to, if you want to scroll the page, you have to hit these tiny little white areas outside the map, otherwise you scroll the map. Now they, they actually, you don't see this very often anymore, but I like to keep it in my presentations because I presented it at my first mobile accessibility presentation in 2014 in New York and the day after Coles was sued for being inaccessible. <laughs> so the next is the text-to-speech trap. Um, if the app has an ability to provide content via text-to-speech, the screen reader user must be able to pause or stop the app speaking in a simple manner, e.g. by performing a swipe on screen. Applies to screen reader users and it's the native app. So basically if there's text-to-speech, they need to be able to navigate through the page or stop it. They can't navigate through the page if they are hearing you know, an article being read. So this is an example here where this is pocket. Uh, you can press play, it reads the article out to you, but there's no easy way for the screen reader to stop that um, playing and they just have to wait till the end of the article. Um, then there's the headset trap. So headset users must always be able to pause media, audio or video content by using the pause play control on the headset. Applies to screen reader users and headset users and it's both methodologies. So this is um, an example here. You go to a web page. There's a little pop-up at the bottom with a video that has audio. There's a touch uh, ability to kind of uh, stop the audio, but if you don't have the ability to touch um, and you are using a headset, that headset pause pauses the screen reader, not that audio. And lastly, we have a layer trap. The user should not be trapped on a non-visible layer. This applies to all users, but it's mostly encountered by screen reader users and sometimes keyboard users. There are a lot of people that use keyboards on mobile devices, and I don't mean the on-screen ones, I mean physical keyboards. And this is both methodologies. So this is an example here. On the left, you have a website. On the right, you have the menu open, which overlays the page. For keyboard and screen reader users, the focus uh, remains on the underlying page. So they can't uh, close the menu, uh, they can't access the menu. Uh, so that can be very difficult. So the next step is test mobile specific issues. Uh, we have different categories. I'm not going to go through all the errors. Um, alternatives, display, actionable items, navigational aids, audio and video, forms, and the mobile and desktop relationship. And then the fifth step is test mobile assistive technology and feature support. So the rule is basically all actionable items and important content can be accessed and activated by the following assistive technology or when the following feature is enabled. And so in iOS, what we decided we would include were voiceover, keyboard, keyboard and switch, zoom, reduce motion, increase text size, invert colors, grayscale and reader view on Safari. On Android, it's very similar. Talkback, keyboard, keyboard and switch, magnification, remove animations, color inversion, grayscale, color correction, increase display size, increase text size, and simplified view on Chrome. Now, I know this is a lot of information, so guess what? It's all on our website. So if you go to resources, why are you not working? I, oh, hold on. Let me, that's probably because you can't see it. No, okay. We're just going to pretend that it works. You go to Accessibility Oz website, <laughs> there is a main menu item called resources and underneath that is mobile testing. And we have a whole series of documents, how to go about testing, how to identify whether your site is, um, you know, an MDOT or responsive, how to capture errors. And then we also have the test cases under each of those categories. And we have a section about why it's important. We have a section on how to test and we have a section on uh, good passes and fails. So there's heaps of stuff that's there. So what's next? Uh, as I said, it was released early 2020, so we are reconvening the committee. We want to include WCAG 2.2 that 
was supposed to be released in April and then in June and then in September and now in December, so hopefully one day. Um, additional assistive technologies and mobile features. I have a great article on voice control and how it can really help you with your assistive technology testing. Uh, review existing test cases because there are some that we don't actually need. Remove some of the assistive technologies and mobile features because sometimes they always pass or they always fail, so you only need to test one and then create an online resource. So I would love you to get involved, even if you don't feel like you know anything about accessibility, if you're a developer, mobile site, native app, if you even just have a little spare time, please contact us because we really, really want uh, people to help us. Uh, the co commitment is, depending on whether you join both committees or one, uh, is a couple of hours once a fortnight um, for the meetings and then, you know, maybe a couple of hours um, research. So the email address to contact us is mobile22 at accessibilityoz.com. Don't forget there is a Drupal South 2022 sprint tomorrow, not tomorrow, Friday. Um, go to drupalsouth.org for more information and please let me know if you have any quick reads. Questions? Yes. Also, I am flying to Sydney immediately after this. So if you want to just grab a card, if I don't get to answer any questions, you're welcome to. Anyone got any questions? Yeah, I've got a question. I, I can talk loudly. Um, are there any accessibility concerns with scroll jacking, like where the content of the page changes as you scroll? Like app, oh, app, yeah. App, 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 app's website is sort of a prime example of this, as where as you scroll down half the way, then you keep scrolling and a picture of a laptop spins on screen, but you don't scroll any further. Yeah. Then after the laptop's done a full rotation, then you keep scrolling. Yeah. That's sort of where you take over scrolling. Does that have any issues? Yeah, so that has quite a few issues. You can do it accessible, accessibly. Um, the State Library of New South Wales, I'm not sure if that's their current site, but we worked with them about four or five years ago on that kind of feature. Uh, it, it is difficult to do, but it can be um, made accessible. We call them one page web applications um, and basically there's uh, the major problems are around keyboard accessibility because if you're a keyboard user then if you're just uh, sniffing for the mouse you know scroll then the keyboard user or the screen reader user just can't go anywhere. So yes the, it can be done but it's a little bit more difficult. Yeah. <coughs> Oh, yeah. No, I can, I can. <laughs> uh, I was wondering, because you, you mentioned about the, um, like, headset controls for that. Um, as a developer, do we have to do anything special using native, let's say, like, a XML5 video player? Will that natively work with the video playing? They hit pause on the headset, will it natively work? Do we have to do extra work for that? That's a and likewise with, like, YouTube and, and other third party services? So I'm actually presenting on video player accessibility in Denver in a month. Uh, basically, I have done a review of video players every year or two for the last six to eight years. And there's only two that are accessible and remain accessible. One of them is ours, which is called Ausplayer, but another one is called Able Player. The others are getting better, but they all have kind of problems around that. From a development perspective, what I can tell you is that in you, can, you never accidentally make things accessible, but most of the time we see things go wrong when people decide to, you know, create something new. So I would say that in your example, it probably does work properly if you're just using an HTML5 video um, player, um, but I, I would have to reserve rights to say that I may be wrong. Yes. But uh, if you have an example, feel free to send me. Yep. You say that you do a review every year. Is that somewhere that we can find on a website somewhere? Yeah, so it's on our website. The last one we did was 2018 because did I mention COVID? Um, so we're going to do it over the next month. Uh, we review about 37 and the problem, uh, 37 different video players. The problem is, is that every year a different player is more accessible. Other, so access, so Ausplayer and Able Player are always in the high 90s percent percentile. The others, they don't really hit more than 60%. And it's always different from year to year which player 
gets to that higher level. So you can't even say, oh, overall, YouTube is the most accessible player because it just changes every single year. So, yeah. But, yes, keep an eye on our website. What was the name of the standard that you guys are making? Like, you found if you ever actually... I didn't mention it. Yes, it was very bad of me. Um, it's uh, the mobile... Let's see if this will want to work now. Oh, I don't know what's going on. Oh, no. Okay. So... It's, see, I'm clicking it, nothing's happening. I hate technology sometimes. <laughs> you know, I, I, I did um, web development. It was. Oh, good. Okay, so under resources, you got mobile testing and it's got no internet, excellent. <laughs> so basically it's called the mobile accessibility testing methodology. Um, that's what it is. Let's try again. Any other questions? While you're trying again, we should probably be talking to the microphone for the recording. We should be, and that's a terrible thing that I did to uh, not do that. We should be talking to the microphone during the recording. Uh, so this is the mobile testing site um, or section, and so it's got there's five documents for the mobile site testing methodology and five for the native app. So you've got the section that's just the methodology itself, think of like WCAG 2. And then there's the about, so devices, assistive technologies, site types, variations of a page, capturing errors. And what I've given you is an incredibly high level. Um, this is a 23 megabyte, you know, uh, Word document. So there's a lot of information there. And then you've got the critical test cases, the test cases, which are those alternatives, display, etc., and the test cases for assistive technologies. I don't recommend that you test an assistive technology unless you need to use it in everyday life. But in reality, not all of us have access to people who need different assistive technologies. So there is some basic information in that document about how you would test with, say, voiceover or a keyboard or things like that. Any other questions? I'll repeat your question. Go. Okay. Yeah. So the question is, what about, well, paraphrasing, what about AR and VR? So the person who runs the ICT Accessibility Testing Symposium in 2020 went, oh, you've been so successful with the mobile testing methodology. How about you do an AR, VR one? And I'm like, mm, I know nothing about those things. So we are plan. I actually am the repository of people who are interested in that. So if you want to send me your details, then I once a committee gets formed, which I will not be a part of, then they can, you know, contact you. <laughs> Would you like to run the committee? <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, um, I was wondering if you think anything from the AAA will ever make it into like be promoted to AA. Interesting that you say that. So the question was, do I think anything from AAA will be promoted to AA? So the touch target size requirement has been promoted to AA in WCAG 2.1, except the sizing is different because the W3C can't, you know, say that they were completely wrong. Um, there are a number of things around learning disability and low vision that, um, oh, such a long story, um, so that have kind of been modified slightly and moved to AA. But one of the things that we did in this methodology when we said, okay, look, you know, we need to make the, you know, mobile sites and things accessible, we went, well, there's a whole lot of really useful guidance in AAA where no one looks. So we actually included some things from AAA. So it's very clear in the methodology what's from AAA. Um, but we did include those things. So hopefully um, the people who are doing WCAG Silver are incorporating this information and it will show up there. Hopefully. Yeah. Um, are there any project types of projects or contexts where AAA is used to do any valid? Yeah, so the question is, are there any projects where AAA is important? And yes, um, we we actually have built a number of AAA websites uh, for disability organisations. So Disability Rights Texas, Disability Rights Washington, uh, you know, so those kind of websites where the main audience are people with disabilities, that's where AAA is really important. Yep. I think I should probably like get off the stage. 
Um, so, but yes, please come up and grab a business card and I'll tweet out at, from the at Accessibility Oz that, that present URL so you can access everything, but it's all on the website as well. So thank you very much.